Hello and welcome to North Shore Fellowship's online service. We are glad that you are here. If you're watching on Facebook, would you click like and share? And if you're watching on YouTube, would you share the link with a friend so that others can find out about this ministry here at North Shore Fellowship? Let's pray together over this time. Father, we ask your blessings over North Shore Fellowship and truly over your entire church all over the planet. Father, we pray that you open our ears today to hear your word, that you open our hearts to give you worship, and that you open us up entirely, Lord God, that we might experience your presence. Father, we know that following after you is the best way to live this life. Father, bless us now and bless us forever. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship.
Welcome back to our series, Faithful Regardless, a study of the book of 1 Samuel. And it is so filled with adventure. We came to the part in the story where Saul is declining as king. David is ascending as king. But right now, as we ended chapter 21, David had become a fugitive, running from Saul. Saul wanted to kill him. And he had gone to the priestly city of Nob, and he lied to them, saying he's on a secret mission from Saul. Help me. Give me some food. Give me a weapon. And he deceived them. And they believed him, and they gave him what he wanted. But they were found out. There was a snitch among them, an informant of Saul named Doeg. And he had went back to Saul, told them what happened, told them that this city helped his enemy, David. And the whole city was slaughtered. So when we last saw David, he's trying to secretly hide and find refuge in, guess what? The enemy city, the Philistine city of Achish. And when he was identified, hey, this is David. This is David who kills 10,000. Um, he was fearful that he was found out and exposed. So he just started to act like he was insane. So insane that even Achish, the, the ruler of the Philistines of the city, did not want anything to do with him. So 1 Samuel 21, we ended the chapter with this. That day, David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. But the servants of Achish said to him, Isn't this David, the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands. David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. So he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. And then Achish said to his servants, look at that man, he's insane. Why bring him to me? Am I so short of madmen that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of him? Must this man come to my house? And that's how, that's how chapter 21 ends. David acting like an insane madman and then being rejected even from uh, Achish in the city of Gath. And now he's all alone, continuing to run away, run away from from God, really, run away from Saul, run away from his integrity. And he finds himself in one of the lowest points in his life, and he ends up in a cave. And that's how 1 Samuel 22, 1 starts. In fact, it starts with these words. It says, David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Now, he's in the cave of Adullam. Now, the, the, the verse actually continues right away, but I want to pause right there. David left Gath. Now he's in a cave all by himself, one of the lowest points of his life. He went from national champion back with Saul. He was anointed as the next king by Samuel. He was living in a palace with his best friend, the son of Saul, Jonathan. He's experiencing the presence of God regularly. Uh, he's, he's having victory in battle. He's having the time of his life just a few, perhaps days ago. And now he finds himself in a place where he's desperate. He's humiliated. He's defeated. He's a fugitive. He's hungry. He's all alone. And he's, all, he's afraid. And he's in this dark cave, the cave of Adulam. And there he is in the darkness. I think about what he must have felt like being rejected by his household, which had become Saul not knowing how he's going to get his next meal, knowing he lied and that lie could lead to destruction, and it does. How did he feel? He probably felt a lot like Jonah did in the belly of the whale. Alone, dark, desolate, hopeless. And he could do nothing from that place except one thing. It's the same thing, by the way, that Jonah did. He cried out to God. It's all he could do, and it's exactly what he did. How do we know this? Well, <laughs> he wrote about it. He wrote exactly what he was feeling at that time. He wrote exactly what he did at that time. And he did it in, in a sort of a prayer set to some, perhaps some type of plaintive music. Well, that's how it's described. And we find this and we read this in something we call Psalm 142. So we're jumping out of 1 Samuel into Psalm 142, and we'll read this. Psalm 142, a mascal of David when he was in the cave, a prayer. Mascal is a prayer set to music. Verse 1. 
I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord of mercy. I pour out before him my complaint. Before him, I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. Look and see, there is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they're too strong for me. Set me free from my prison, that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. This is a deep prayer of desperation, a deep prayer to God for help and rescue. And you know what? The Lord heard his cry and answered his prayer. Soon, very soon, his family came to him to encourage him. Others gathered around him. People who were in distress and discontent themselves, they gathered around and and vowed to follow him. The Lord answered his prayer, rescued and restored him. This was a turning point in David's life, a pinnacle moment. Who knows how deep the despair would have gone if he didn't find himself in that cave crying out to God. But he did, and he humbled himself before the Lord. And because he humbled himself and cried out to God, instead of what he had been doing, operated in his his own pride and deception like he had just done before, well, the Lord answers his prayer. And that verse, verse 1, continues. It says, when his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. Verse 3 says, From there David went to Mitzpah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, Would you let my mother and my father come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? You see, he's trusting God. So he left them with the king of Moab and they stayed with him as long as David was in the stronghold. Verse 5, But the prophet Gad said to David, Do not stay in the stronghold. Go into the land of Judah. So David left and went to the forest of Hereth. Now, the chapter cuts over to the part where Saul is summoning the men of of Nob. And he's summoning Ahimelech. And he's, he's questioning him about helping David. So while David's on his way to Judah in Hereth, the forest of Hereth, David, uh, Saul is actually grilling these guys about helping David. He's infuriated. And this is the part where he calls for the death of all the inhabitants of Nob, including Ahimelech, the priest, who was the son of Ahitub and who was also a priest. But his son, Abiathar, escapes. So we'll jump to verse 20. It says, but one son of Ahimelech, son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled to join David. And he told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. And then David said to Abiathar, that day when Doeg the Edomite was there, I knew he would be sure to tell Saul, I'm responsible for the death of your whole family. Stay with me. Don't be afraid. The man who wants to kill you is trying to kill me too. You will be safe with me. So look at that. All at once, David had, come, <clears throat> had gone from being a refugee to a rescuer. He's now operating uh, in confidence. Now he's operating in a place of strength. He's offering safety and refuge to others who were just like him, distressed and afraid. You know, when, he be- when we began this chapter, he was the one that was desperate and alone and afraid in the cave, crying out to God. But soon God responded to him and provided companions for him, followers for him. Now, they weren't the elite personnel that Saul was surrounding himself with, no. These were, according to 1 Samuel 22, 2, we just read this, these were all those who were in distress or in debt or discontented. Kind of the misfits gathered around him and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. These were his followers. These were his compadres. Those who were in distress, like him, in debt sort of like him, and discontented, very much like him. What does all that mean? Distress, debt, and discontented. Well, distress, we're not told what these people were distressed by, but we can guess. They were probably being oppressed by King Saul, just like everyone else was, including David. 
and they came out of David. They came to David out of sheer necessity and need because they believed that he could help them. And they sensed in him a kindred spirit that was also in distress. What about in debt? Well, in David's time, if a man got in over his head in debt, he could lose all that he owned. He could become a slave and his whole family could be enslaved. And there was no protection about, against that. However, there was in the law of Moses to keep fellow Israelites from becoming slaves indebted to someone else. But Saul disregarded that law like he did many of the laws of Moses. And they found themselves running to David for refuge. And what about the discontented? These are people who were suffering under the oppression of Saul, suffering under the circumstances, obviously being oppressed also by the Philistines, their enemy. They're discontent, they're bitter in Saul, and maybe, once again, they found something kindred in David who was also feeling this way. Now, he's with this group. He's no longer alone. He's got the, his family tucked away and, and secured in Moab because he wanted them to be protected. But he's got these 400 men that are discontented and distressed. But he also has Abiathar. Abiathar, the priest. And this is a man who becomes very important to David. Remember, he just got rescued. He, he ran away, actually, from the slaughter. His whole family was slaughtered. And Abiathar <clears throat> is of great service to David, especially much later when David's own son rebels against him, Absalom, wanting to kill David, Abiathar played heavily into the help of David in that point. He becomes a king's counselor. He becomes the high priest when uh, David ascended the throne. So the Lord is now with David. He's blessing David, not because of anything other than David is seeking the Lord instead of seeking his own way. David is humbling himself and trusting God instead of taking matters into his own hands. Now, at the start of 1 Samuel 23, he got this small, very committed army. He has the covering of the Lord. And let's, um, and let's see what he does with that. <clears throat> Move on to chapter 23, first five verses. When David was told, look, the Philistines are fighting against Kela, and they are looting the threshing floors, he inquired of the Lord saying, shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord answered him, go attack the Philistines and save Kelah. But David's men said, here in Judah we were afraid, how much more than if we go to Kelah against the Philistine forces? Once again, David inquired of the Lord and the Lord answered him, go down to Kelah for I am going to give the Philistines into your hands. So David and his men went to Kelah. They fought the Philistines and carried off their livestock. He inflicted heavy losses on the Philistines and saved the people of Kelah. A victory. A victory for a man who was desperate alone in a cave just a few verses ago. <laughs> this is the early beginnings of the reign of King David, Israel's greatest king. This is where he starts his ascent from cave to the crown cave of Adullam to the crown of the king of Judah and then on to king of Israel. It's marked times with, with this journey of seeking and inquiring of the Lord, oftentimes crying out to the Lord, not just this time, but other times, and then always humbling himself in prayer and in worship. Humble prayer, humble worship. The Psalms are filled with that from David. Now, unlike Saul, David learned from his mistakes quickly. He was quick to admit his faults and repent when he sinned. And God blessed David and anointed the kingdom of David. The opposite was true of Saul. In fact, the kingdom of Israel has long been called the throne of David. David wasn't the first king, Saul was. But it's called the house of David, the throne of David. In fact, Jesus was called the son of David 17 times in the New Testament. He's identified with Israel's greatest king, also from the tribe of his own tribe, Judah, King David. So let's just look back at what just, what just transpired. What a tremendous metamorphosis. After defeating Goliath, David, you'd think he'd be the national hero and everything would be okay. And he even adds to that. Not only does he defeat Goliath, but he goes after tens of thousands of Philistines and defeats them as well. But Saul was so jealous, so here's what happens. 
He lost his position in Saul's household. He was treated unfairly and unjustly and forced to relocate, basically got kicked out. He was desperate for provision, so desperate he was begging for bread, and he tried to find it by dishonest means, by lying to the people of Nob. He then sought refuge by trying to hide in enemy territory, but he was found out. The results were that he was a broken man, a hopeless man. He resorted to faking, feigning insanity and found himself alone and desolate in the cave of Adullam. And it wasn't until there where he was humbled by God and really crying out to God that David was restored. Think about that journey, that succession of events in his life. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt that you've lost everything and everything's hopeless? Maybe you lost your job, your home, your marriage, or something or someone else. Maybe you were treated unjustly and unfairly by those that you trusted. Maybe you were forced to move or relocate it. Maybe you'd become desperate, so desperate for provision that you worried how you ever, ever make ends meet. Maybe you even considered finding comfort or relief by going outside the camp. You know, people in worldly places. Have you ever felt like God has forsaken or forgotten you? <clears throat> or that you made so many mistakes that he might as well have? And you feel like you're all alone in a cave. Hmm. All of us have felt that way. There have been several times in my life where I felt just like David did in the cave of Adilam. I couldn't see how God was going to work things out. Things seemed to have become so desperate and awful, hopeless in my life. But I know when you're at that place, just like David, you pretty much have nothing else that you can do but cry out to God for help for rescue. And God is so faithful to answer those prayers. If any of you ever felt that way, you're in good company. You're just like the rest of us, and you're very much like King David. And David soon rose from that cave to prominence. It took years, but it was an ascension to the throne. And his army, this little band of misfits that were discontent and, dis and, and in debt and disillusioned, they grew and they grew and they soon became the most powerful force in the land. He's eventually become surrounded by the wisest and the most skilled people to ever serve any king. And his kingdom flourished and it prospered until he himself rose to a level of greatness that few other Bible characters have ever achieved. He is listed among the greatest Bible characters that there is in both the Old and New Testament. But remember, he did not start out that way. This journey that we just saw did not start out that way. He started out all alone, crying out to God in desperation. He started out surrounded by a group of misfits, distressed, in debt, discontented people who were as aware, as aware of their dire need for God's favor as David was. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're distressed because you've lost someone or something important in your life. Maybe you're in debt and you have bills and mortgage and you have material needs and you have no way how you're going to be able to pay for them. Maybe you're discontented. Yeah, suffering discontent because of the wrong things that were done to you. Or maybe even wrong things done by you. Or maybe just the good things that you hoped to receive did not come to you. And that's led to deep discontentment. Proverbs calls it heart sickness. If you feel like you are in the cave of Ajilam in your life and you're all alone and you're, all af and you're afraid and you feel hopeless, I want to tell you, you're in a very good place. How do I say that and why do I say that? You're in a very good place because God keeps his promises, and one of them is right there in Psalm 46.1. God is our refuge and our strength and an ever-present help in time of trouble. Our refuge and our strength. Some versions say a very present help in time of need, and that's what you need, that help, that strength, and that refuge. 
And I encourage you to cry out to God and watch what happens. Now remember, be careful not to try to find your own way out and untangle it yourself. Don't rely on your own abilities. Don't desperately pursue resources and try to take for yourself, especially by dishonest gain, instead of trusting God. No, no, no. Rely upon him, trust in him, cry out to him, and let him deliver. Remember, remember the prayer that David prayed. I call it the prayer of Dave in the cave. It's Psalm 142. And pray that prayer yourself. I'll, we'll pray it as we close. Psalm 142. I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him my complaint. Before him I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. I cry to you, Lord. You are my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Friend, no matter how difficult things are now or how hard they become, never lose heart. Never lose hope. Cry out to God. He'll become your refuge. He'll become your portion. He'll become your strength. He'll become your ever-present help in time of need. And he'll become your help in time of trouble. Not just when you get to heaven, but as promised right here in Psalm 142, right here in the land of the living. God bless you. Well, thank you, Pastor. A warm welcome to you all. Great to be with you again. Uh, I hope you're getting out and enjoying some of this tremendous weather. For me, this is some of the best weather of the year. It's a little cooler in the mornings and the evenings and yet warmer during the day. The only thing is, if you're going to enjoy this time of the year, you better enjoy the flavor of pumpkin spice, right? It's in the cookies, it's in the donuts, it's in the coffee. You get it everywhere you go at this point. Well, why don't we take a look at some of the things that are coming up for our church. First up is for the guys. This coming Saturday is the Men's Monthly Fellowship. That's at 8 a.m. It's at the Peninsula location. And guys, we do meet out on the front lawn, so do bring a chair. Our guest speaker this month is Jeff Hackworth. You're going to want to hear him. It's uh, just a terrific time. So do come out and enjoy. This is uh, friendly for the younger guys, so do indeed bring out the kids with you. Uh, next up is Sunday, October the 24th, the Seabright Fall Freedom Fest. This is a terrific event. We had it last year. It's bigger this year. We're going to be there doing Christian music and helping out. We'd love to have you serve if you want to. It's going to have kids' activities, worship, speakers, booths, tents, and resources on addiction, fear, and codependency awareness. Very topical for where we are today. Uh, it's going to be, again, on the 24th from 1 to 5 p.m. If you'd like to get information on this, you contact us at info here at the church. Hey, we have another outing that's coming up. You remember the Backpack Blessings missions? Well, we have a mini missions trip associated with it now. They're going into New York City on Saturday, October the 30th, where they're going to be distributing all the bags and backpacks that were turned in. If you would like to join them, they'd love to have you. Your contact for that is Melissa at her email address. Got one other one to keep on the calendar for it. How about November the 28th? Now that is Thanksgiving weekend. It is the Sunday. And we are going to have our single service Sunday, SSS. Uh, what we're going to do is instead of having our two services, as we normally do, we're only going to have one. It's going to be at 10 a.m. at the Bell Works building in Homedale. And we want to get the entire congregation together. Now, not only we get all of our regular folks together, we'd love to have... New folks, guests, friends, if you've been looking for a date to invite somebody out to church, this would be the one to remember. That's November the 28th at 10 a.m. at the Bell Works building. More details to follow. Let's talk about some of our fellowship groups and chances to get together. Uh, for the men, every Thursday, we remind you that there is the men's Bible study. <clears throat> it's at the Bell Works building in Homedale. They do have a Zoom link if you can't make it there. Great time to get together. And they watch a little football afterwards, so terrific night out. We want to remind you about our missions team, a chance to come alongside, be introduced to, and support the missionaries out in the field. Your contact for that is Tasha AC, a great ministry to be involved with. And of course, table for four or more. Here's a chance to get to meet the folks around the church. Go, will you submit your information to us? We'll get another couple that would like to get together with you. 
Go out for a meal, breakfast, lunch, dinner, after service, whatever works. Just a chance to get to know each other better. Your contact for that uh, on email is Sue Avery. Look, there is a lot more going on than just the few things that I can bring up in the time that we have here. The best way is to get on our email list. You send your information to us at info at northshorenj.org. Everything comes right to your inbox. You'll get all the details, the links, the Zoom numbers, everything that you need will come right in there. And also contacts if you have any questions. I want to remind you that every Wednesday we have Worship in the Word at 7 p.m. Facebook and YouTube Live, interactive, tons of fun. If you haven't uh, tuned in for that, please do, and please participate. Regular Sunday services in person, 9 a.m. is the early service at Fair Haven, and 11 a.m. at Bell Works in Homedale. And of course, for our online friends, 9 and 10.30 on Facebook and YouTube Premiere. Hey, we would love to have you involved in all the things that are going on. We'd love to have you come out. We'd also love to have you come and participate with us financially. If you'd like to help support the mission and work that goes on here at North Shore Fellowship, you can use our new QR code, which will take you right to the giving page, or you can go to our website. Very easy to get there. Very easy for your financial gift to come in. Uh, we, as always, thank all of you who have been so faithful in your tithes and offerings and your support for all that goes on. Would you join me in praying for this offering? Dear Lord, we come before you and we say thank you. We thank you for all that you provide, the blessings that you give, the future that can only come from you, the forgiveness that you bought at such a price. Father, we ask that you would receive these gifts back now, that you would take them, that you would multiply them, that you would direct them, that you would make us wise in what to do and how to do it. Father, we ask your blessing for all the work and things that go on here at North Shore Fellowship. Father, we thank you and praise you. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So, look, we really do hope to see you very, very soon. Please remember that you are always welcome. Have a wonderful week, and may God bless you all.
children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May His presence go before you. Thank you for joining with us for North Shore Fellowship's online service. I hope that you received something from the Lord, received something in worship and the word and fellowship with others online. But more importantly, I hope that you're crying out to God for the needs that you have in your life. M remember, you're never alone, and he's a very present help in time of trouble. If you've never given your life to Jesus, cry out and say, save me, Lord, rescue me, forgive me. Allow him to come into your life. And if you need help with that, we'd be glad to walk you through a prayer of salvation. If you need prayer for anything else, please reach out to us. Don't be afraid and don't be alone. We're all in this together and we are with you. We love you and we're glad that you're with us. God bless you. Have a great day.